Hey peeps, you guys are going really well. We're already at part three of our base plate build for our three degree of freedom motion platform simulator. What I'm wanting to do at the beginning of this video in part three is just have a very quick talk about some critical uh, issues that you may have when you're MIG welding. And hopefully by me uh, talking about this, it might make your um, experience with welding uh, a lot smoother and less frustrating. I'm also going to talk a little bit more in depth about our angle grinders and actually how to change the blades properly. I was very brief uh, with the angle grinder in the last video, so we're gonna go into more detail this time, just to be fair for those who haven't actually used some of this gear before. Some may have used it and it's just a no brainer, but for some people they may not have, so I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail, then we'll be getting uh, into our build in this video in earnest. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about, now I have encouraged you to already seek some YouTube videos on welding. So I'd still encourage you to do that um, for some better intense training on welding. But what you may not find on some of those videos is some of the problems and issues that you may encounter when you're welding. Now this is specific to our MIG welder, what I'm talking about at the moment. So with MIG welders, firstly, the great advantage of a, of a MIG welder over a stick welder is that you only have to build muscle memory for one axis. Okay, which is just your horizontal, whether you're pulling your pull or pushing your pull, because the wire is constantly feeding. Okay, so you only have to maintain one distance, roughly 10 to 15 millimeters, okay, because it feeds automatically. With a stick welder, of course, because you're using an electrode and the electrode is used as you're welding, you have to become proficient at two axes the horizontal and moving in ways as the welding electrode is used. That's why there's a big advantage in using a MIG amongst other advantages. That is one big advantage. Those that are learning how to use this MIG, what's gonna happen with you guys until you become more proficient, until you've built some muscle memory, is you may find that you end up fusing your gasless MIG wire here in your tip more frequently. And this is particularly going to happen if you haven't cleaned your work pieces properly, especially if they're painted or they have primer on them, okay? That's why it's really important to get that stuff clean. So gasless MIG wire is a lot dirtier to use that than it is with gas. These are the tips that normally go on with gas and what these do, these create a cone of gas which protects your welding pool and keeps it a lot cleaner when you're using gas. Gasless MIG wire works just as well as far as strength and all those sorts of things go, but it's a lot dirtier because you don't have that protection for your whirlpool. So there's a lot more splatter, a lot more smoke and a lot more rubbish always basically coming back at your tip. So what happens, and until you become better at keeping that distance, what you may find happen is from time to time, and this is gonna happen regardless, even with me, probably every hour, every hour and a half of constant welding, I would probably have to change these welding tips out. What happens is you get splatter and junk that ends up inside the end of your tip and it will fuse your wire into the tippy. Now it will normally happen, and you'll notice it's starting to happen because you'll notice when you're trying to get an arc, it'll splatter, it'll carry on. It won't seem to be working very well. And then the next minute there'll be no arc. You'll still hear your MIG roll in your machine winding out. Will I do that again? You'll hear that noise because your spool is actually running from the motor in your machine, but there'll be no wire coming out here. You don't want that. Because what's happening is your wire is jamming in the tip, but it's unwinding in your machine. And it'll, you'll end up with a bird's nest of MIG wire in your machine that you've just wasted. So when this happens, take your finger off the trigger. Stop immediately. If you come to a situation where suddenly your arc won't stay constant and your MIG wire is not coming out, it's more than likely fused in your tip. You must get your finger off that trigger so then you're not creating a mess inside your MIG welder because then what will happen, because that MIG welder will be all unusable because it'll be kinked, etc. You'll end up having to remove your tip and you'll have to remove all your wire out of your hose. You'll need to open your machine. You'll have to cut the wire on your roll where it's all spooled inside. You'll have to re-thread it and run more wire and you'll waste a lot of MIG wire. Even though this is really designed to use with gas, I keep the nozzle on anyway, because it does give that tip a little bit more protection when it's on. Ultimately, you'll still have this issue over time, but it does help increase the life of this. That's why you need to buy a couple of packets of those 0.8 millimeter 
welding tips. They're very cheap, about $6 for 10, because you will end up inevitably having to change them. These are changed just with, you can just use a normal pair of pliers. They've just got a flat spot on the end of your welding tip. They'll just come off with a pair of pliers. Sometimes that might be hard to get off if this has fused, because the wire will be fused or welded into the tip. You'll just have to take it off with that wire just spinning. Then you'll be able to sort of move it back and forwards and then eventually it'll come off. Or you may have to pull it out a bit. If your wire is then free and you can feed it with this still stuck on, just let it feed out, cut your wire, get rid of that tip, put a new tip in. Like thread your wire back through the new tip and then screw your new tip back in and you're ready to go again. So I hope that is a little bit helpful, guys. Um, when you come across that problem, you'll know what's going on and hopefully that you'll avoid jamming this up and wasting a whole bunch of MIG wire and causing yourself a lot of frustration because it is time consuming having to stop and reattach your MIG wire, run it all through your hose again, and it's a waste of wire. That's a little bit of a tip from uh, the doctor for you guys today on your welding. Another very handy tool to have in your arsenal as far as welding goes, particularly if you're using a MIG, is a gun holder, okay? So this is a magnetic one. So depending on what the surface is that you're working off, Obviously, if it's metal, you can get a magnetic one like this. It's very important not to leave your gun and hose lying around on the floor. You're likely to walk on it and damage it. And if you do have a cheaper MIG, often your guns and hoses are all one piece and they're not easily replaceable. So something like this is invaluable for prolonging the life of your gun and your hose. You can get these... Uh, gun holders without a magnet so I'd encourage you to look around for one of those I just want to give you guys a big thumbs up for continuing with this build well done guys part four is in a week's time and we're almost finished with our base plate in that video we talk all about uh, how we get it painted I take you through how to prep your metal what etch primers to use obviously paint is your choice because it's gonna be down to your taste, the colors you wanna paint it in, but I would encourage you to consider painting it. It's a little bit more work, but it's well worth it. Big thumbs up and thanks to everybody who subscribed. Really, really appreciate you guys. Our new viewers, I would encourage you to subscribe as well so you can get notifications for when the next videos are out. We're really sort of getting into this build and we're almost there with the base plate. Next, we move on to our mid frame. And there's some really exciting stuff to get our teeth into with the next level of our three degree of freedom motion platform simulator. Let's have a little bit of how to use an angle grinder 101. We need to know how to change our different discs in our angle grinder for our different applications, all right? So because we are planning on painting this three degree of freedom motion platform as discussed, we need to start thinking about cleaning up our work pieces before we go further getting this grey metal scale off. I believe one of the best methods for doing this is using one of these flap discs, what are called like a flap disc pad. It's multiple layers of sandpaper basically, and it really rips off paint, mill scale. It can be even used to grind within reason. Okay, but it is an excellent choice for actually removing large areas at a reasonably quick pace. How do we use our angle grinders? How do we change the discs on our angle grinders? Okay, all angle grinders will come with a key. All angle grinders, lock nuts, well, any angle grinder I've ever used, they all have these little hole inserts that our key inserts into. Did, did, did mummy and daddy talk to you about the birds and the bees? Let's go no further than that. On the top side of your angle grinder, all angle grinders I've ever used, I'll have this little locking button here, okay? All right, that's that one on this one, on my Milwaukee. Similar sort of uh, scenario. All right, that locks your spindle. See how that's turning now? All right, if you press this in, you may have to turn it. Oh, there it goes, it's locked in instantly. It needs to be locked in to be able to remove the lock nut. Our key goes in, so we press that in and we hold it in. Key goes in, anti-clockwise. Off comes our lock nut, okay? Off comes our grinding disc. Now, 
grinding discs are a lot thicker than cutting discs. So you have to use your lock nut in a different way. You'll see that uh, you've got this machined top on this lock nut, right? That fits in the inner diameter of your grinding disc here, right? So for grinding discs, which are a lot thicker and sit up further, you have to turn this upside down. So then this machined surface here, okay? So that machined surface goes down inside the disc. Otherwise, if you put it on the other way, this disc will move around. It'll wobble, it'll be out of control. Okay, so that's just a little side note that you need to be aware of with grinding discs. All right, cutting disc, all right. Also on your angle grinder, you've got a machine surface here on this little piece, okay. A, this is like a keyway in your angle grinder here. Just by the by, this comes off. Be careful of that. And when you put it back on, you have to locate uh, this machined area out here, in here. Okay. Your angle grinder disc goes on, and it will go around this inside diameter of the grinding of the cutting disc here. It will go around there, so it can't move. You don't want it to be able to be able to do this. It sits over that machine part. This time, this just goes on flat. Okay, up as tight as you can by hand. Always, of course, holding our spindle lock here, getting a cramp. Okay, now once you make sure this is not moving so that it's actually located properly, you'll put your key back in, keep your locking position, and just do it up firmly. You don't need to overdo it. I sometimes just do the discs up by the discs themselves once this is gripped, and that's it. You don't have to do them up too, too tight, just firmly with your key. They're the two common uh, techniques that you need to use for the different discs. Okay, here's our flat disc. It's also going to require this to be flat, this to be put on, because this is flush. In here, right? So this needs to go on the flat side, not the elongated side. Right? So once that's tight, I can just turn that whole piece and that's now on there tight, right? This is ready to use. I would recommend uh, that you use your gloves all the time when you're grinding, particularly when you're using these discs, okay? They create a lot of spark. Flap discs, not so much, so I'm gonna run the gauntlet just to give you the demonstration here of how well this does clean the metal up. <laughs> Etc. Etc. Okay, so I even used that flap disc there to uh, round off my edges. Now, if you do use it to actually try and remove material from your metal, you are going to chew through this a lot faster than you would a grinding disc. Grinding disc can take those edges and round things off much quicker. Uh, it won't be as smooth, but it'll be suffice for being safe and removing chips and shards and sharp edges. Okay, so mostly I would use your grinding disc for rounding and cleaning up. This used for removing your mill scale. Look, I can almost bloody shave in that. So we're removing all that mill scale from our work pieces. I'm not gonna do it now. Um, I'm gonna show you now how we're gonna uh, weld this bracket together to create our bracket for our traction loss uh, motor. Okay, here we have our three pieces of our 50 by eight millimeter thick 
flat steel that we've cut at 250 millimetres in length, two of them, one of them at 200 millimetres. This includes our uh, top bracket piece that we've just drilled, which um, ultimately takes our piece of Merbau timber, so then we have our isolation between all of our motors. What we need to do with these pieces now is we need to uh, grind them. I'm gonna show you what I mean by that to prep them for welding so then they've got the best strength they're going to have for their application, okay? Ultimately, they're gonna end up as a 90 degree bracket with our 200 millimeter piece acting as the bracing. We're going to utilize our vice. So again, another recommendation in the tools video to get a vice and you'll see the vice in action now and why it's pretty handy to have one. So um, let me set a piece up now. Okay, I've got the uh, main part of our 90 degree bracket placed in our vise. Our vise tightened up, it's level. I've used the vise jaws at the top here to basically level it. Not super important with what we're doing, but let's get it level. Okay, clamped, so I can't go anywhere. What we're doing here is we're gonna create a bevel where our welds are going to go so then we can get more material into our brackets as far as our welding goes. Whenever we're welding two pieces of metal together, we want to, wherever they're going to be joined, we want, if we can, to have some space to get fill weld in because it will make the weld stronger. So we're always trying to get a valley happening. I don't know if you can see that, but like a V. Now that's obviously massive. Uh, it's not going to be quite like that, but we want to create some space. Now for this bracket, for example, this is how it will be sitting, right? either like this or with that on the bottom it's six of one or half a dozen of the other so let's do this with our bottom piece of the bracket we'll be sitting on top of this one so what we need to grind okay is we need to grind two areas we want to grind a bevel into this piece right and this piece that's going to join at the back here we want to bevel that as well. So then when they go together, they have a bit of a V ground in here that will basically fill with weld and give this a lot more strength. This piece that's on the bottom, because it's gonna sit flat this side, we also wanna bevel that. It's not, nothing we can do about this piece because it's just flat steel. We can bevel uh, some material off this side. So when it's sitting on here, right, there will be a gap through here that our weld can go into and give our bracket a lot more strength right so let's do that now we're, we're, we're going to bevel our bottom piece of our bracket this is the piece that will stick up in the air so this is our bottom piece it will be beveled one end doesn't matter you can flip it over but one end of this piece of metal that's going to be on the bottom needs to be beveled both sides this piece is just beveled on the face inside face it will bevel there okay let me get the grinder and uh, show you what I'm what I'm going on about. Uh, now the problem is I've still got my flap disc on, so let me change this to the actual grinding disc, and then we'll get into it. Okay, guys, I'm going to put my face shield on. I'm going to put my gloves on. Safety first. <coughs> I'm going to get this flap disc off now because I've only put it on hand tight. If I lock this. I can undo it. A bit awkward doing this with gloves. Maybe I should have done this before I started shooting the video. But this is not my first rodeo, as they say. Uh, keep me in mind that I've never been in a rodeo. <laughs> uh, it'd be funny watching a fat man on the back of a bull. Right. Okay, that's all. Okay. We're going to grind our bevel onto the inside face. So when this is sitting up like this, this will be facing our traction loss motor. Okay, so we're gonna put a bevel in along here. That's really about all we need. You're aiming at almost like a 45 degree angle that you're taking out. Uh, of your piece of metal, right? Let's swap this over now for our other piece. Keeping in mind that with our bottom piece of our bracket, we will be 
beveling it on both sides. Right. This is a good one to look at because it's been beveled both sides. Okay. Don't know if you can see that. But instead of it being flat like that on one end, we've created a point, if you like, because we've done roughly 45 degree uh, shades both sides. So now when that goes on... <coughs> upright piece of our bracket. Oops, gotta let that come through a little bit. Okay, and that now sits on here. On the bottom, we've got a nice gap that our weld is gonna fill into. And it's gonna give this a lot more strength. On the inside where this has been beveled, and this has also been beveled, it's the same deal. Okay, we've got a gap here from this bevel, which will fill with weld really nicely. Again, we need to clean the mill scale off. Where that will weld in, so it's a nice clean weld. A little bit on this one as well. saw the fact that I didn't put my uh, face shield on or my gloves. I've just been doing this for too long. <laughs> okay, that's what we're going to do to prep our bracket. Um, our, uh, our gusset, which ultimately is going to sit like this, all right, you'll just take a little bit off one side because we won't really be welding underneath. It's too hard to get to, but we'll take off uh, just a little bit off one side of each of our gusset so when it goes on uh, it sits a little bit flatter um, and our weld will naturally go in to the top of it because you know because it's not sitting like this and it's sitting down like that it's creating a, a 45 degree angle inside there anyway right, yeah, i'm going to set these up now to weld uh, i'm going to show you a little trick with uh, getting 90 degrees uh, with pieces of steel that i learned off a boiler maker uh, a few years ago and it's actually really clever uh, hopefully it's going to work and I'm not going to look like an idiot. But um, the way things go with me, I'll probably look like an idiot. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is certainly one way and a very common practice for getting things at 90 using your angle finder welding magnets. Once again, the tool list video refer to if you haven't watched that. Okay, so this most of the time works quite well. Um, depending on the size of the metal you're welding and how much heat you're putting into the metal, um, because it's going to depend on how much force ends up being on this magnet as far as the uh, metal moving with heat. Uh, sometimes the magnets aren't strong enough, okay, and um, they will just move. Now, we, we eliminate that risk by tacking before we actually start our full welds, as I have discussed ad nauseum. But what I'm going to show you is a little trick that a boiler maker showed me. It's a little bit, takes a little bit of finesse. Um, sometimes I get it first time, sometimes it's not quite right and I've got to tap my piece to its 90. But we won't use the magnet for this. I'll, I'll show you this. All right. So I'll need to fire up my welder and I'll need to get my workpiece grounded. So I have a great advantage uh, with this workshop, guys. Obviously, I've got a, a welding table here. So all my pieces of metal on this welding table, my ground is a little tang that uh, is attached to the welding table. So I don't have to actually attach the ground to the work pieces, which is an advantage. Now you're not gonna have that, so you're gonna have to uh, attach your, your ground plant to your work piece, right? So you might have to, you'll have an area cleaned on your uh, 
workpiece here, and you might have to have your clamp on this already, which means that you're going to have to be careful with uh, getting your 90 because you're not flat on the you're not flat on a table or the floor now. So I would recommend for you guys really doing this to use that um, 90 degree magnet angle finder to do this, and you'll just do a couple of little tacks before you do a main weld, and then on the back and on the front, and then it'll stay at 90. You'll keep your magnet on there. Um, for as long as you can until you start doing your big welds to keep that 90 degree angle. Okay, but for me, because I've got a, a, a way of having my ground, my whole table around and my work, my metal work pieces are already on the table. I don't need to have the clamp actually on the work pieces. Just going to make sure you can see this. Right here, so I'll just uh, get my gloves, my welding helmet, turn the welder on. And I'll show you this little trick that I hope is going to work. Before I actually weld this together, guys, just a very quick reminder to have your fan running. I've got mine running just off to the right here, so it's going to blow any fumes away from where I'm breathing. And we need to uh, locate our um, work pieces here in the right orientation. So then when they actually go on the sim, they, the holes, particularly for our upright piece, our holes are on the right side. So when you place this on... When you weld this and you have it on the table, so use this as the piece that's flat on the table, make sure your holes which are offset are on the left hand side. Okay, they have to be on the left hand side and then when uh, we put it up on our sim, they are located on the left. Right, we're going to come to weld that. Rightio. So all I'm going to do, right, is I'm going to allow that magic heat that I keep going on about all the time to do its job and I'm going to actually deliberately weld this off 90 okay and I'm <laughs> I've done this many times and it works like a trick I'm really hoping it happens now that I'm actually videoing this when I put the heat in this will go and it will come to, to a 90 degree stop that's the plan everything needs to be lined up So what I've done, it, it did come forward quite a lot, but I had it too, I had the angle accentuated too far off the 90, okay? It was just too much. So as you can see, it does work, but you have to get that finesse right with how much you actually have it back for it to pull up to 90. So the safe thing to do is actually to use your um, to use your 90 degree angle brackets. That's actually coming up even more as we as we watch the damn thing. That's gold. So I'm just going to quickly put this in my big vise and just bend it back to 90. Okay. So yeah, use your use your 90 degree angle finder. So then you get a nice 90. And what we'll do is while the magnet is still on there, right? I'm a little bit too far in my big vise. So it's coming in a little bit. I'm not using this piece. Obviously, I've already got mine built. This is just for demonstration purposes. What you will do, okay, is you'll have your magnet in place so you've got this at 90. Sorry, it'll be like this actually, with this piece with the holes on the ground. The holes, if we're looking at it like this to the left-hand side. You'll have your magnet on and what you'll do is you will get your, your welder and you will tack put some good tacks in each corner okay in each corner of your piece on the on the on the inside and then on the back side and we, can, we can do this now because this hasn't been welded yet okay so if you do that if you tack that in each corner, back and front, you can uh, 
can take your magnet away because you don't want to cook that. And then you can weld your bead in. Right, now I'm not going to keep doing it because I'm not going to use this piece. So you'll, you'll, you'll put a nice bead in the inside, then you'll turn it over. And in your, in your gap here at the back, you'll put a nice bead in at the back. Right, and then that is that part of the bracket built. Okay, then we just have to put our gusset in. I don't measure everything, I also use my eye. You could put this on your side. You could have a look at that. Right, and you could work out where, have a look by eye. Right, get it so then it's nice and even. You've got an even distance between these two. This, this can move up and down and around and around and all sorts of ways. So you're going off your distance from where your gusset is here back to this point and that point so you can measure it if you want or just by eye. You'll get it pretty close by eye and it will be enough to get the job done. What you don't want to do is you want to make sure you don't go anywhere near your holes. Okay, don't go up here and forget your holes there. Right, be away from your hole because your bolt's got to come through there. Okay, so you can get it close to where your bolt's going to be. Remembering the higher you've got it on your bracket here, the better it's going to be for stopping this from pulling from your traction loss motor. But you don't want to interfere with your bolt hole. So you, get, I'd, I, you know what I'd do? I'd get it close. I'd get it probably uh, 20 millimetres from my bolt hole and we'll call that a day. 20 millimetres from your bolt hole. One there. See that's already moved. I should have done that in the middle. Okay, I should have done it in the middle and then put one in the middle at the bottom. But I didn't. I'm not too worried because this is just the demonstration purposes. When you do it, Okay, come 20 millimetres down from your bottom hole to put your gusset in here. Okay, make sure it's lined up. This is not lined up. I haven't even lined it up properly because I'm rushing to do this. No need to rush, but that's just me. Off my head all the time. So, make sure it's lined up and square with everything else and put one in the middle. Okay, just a little one in the middle. This will naturally lift up because of the heat, but because you've only got one tack, it'll be easy to push this back down and then put a tack in the bottom. going nowhere then you can run a bead along the top you can run a bead along the bottom and that's your bracket built ready to be welded onto your 50 by 25 box well done well done guys this bracket that you have just built is going to sit exactly 200 millimeters in from the end of your traction loss plate keeping in mind that your 25 by 50 millimeter Box steel is all the way at the end here, 200 millimetres. So you're going to measure in 200 millimetres, right? Make a mark, make sure you've cleaned your 25 by 50 millimetre box because it will come primed. It'll come with blue primer on it. Avoid buying galvanised uh, box if you can. Sometimes you can't avoid it because some sizes are only done in gal and they're not done in primer. Anyway, Whatever it is, you need to get your angle grinder and you need to clean your box and you need to clean your mill scale off your um, bracket that you've made. And you can do that previous to building this. It's much easier. So along all the edges of your 250 millimeter pieces before you join them, run your grinder along and make sure they're all just clean metal. Make sure that's all cleaned with your angle grinder. Make sure everything's clean with your angle grinder. And like I said, once this is on, place 200 millimeters to the, to the, to the back side of the bracket here inboard 200 mil sit it on clamp it right clamp it with your clamps and then go around and weld it zzz, 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 tack it right around right around and uh that's all you need to do let's get our 1600 millimeter length of spine for our base plate let's get it joined to our traction loss plate okay as mentioned the traction loss plate is a thousand millimeters in length one meter in length First thing to do is to measure halfway to your halfway mark of that, which will be 500 millimetres, okay? And then mark it at the leading edge here. I've got a full mark. You don't need that. You just need a mark at the leading edge, half at the halfway point of your traction loss plate, which will be at 500 millimetres. Again, as we've done with the front of our spine, where we put on our um, stabiliser foot, 
you need to mark the center of your 1600 millimeter long by 75 millimeter um, spine, which is 37.5. And then you're gonna line these two lines up. So then this is exactly centered with this. You will already have put a 45 degree bevel on the end of your 1600 millimeter flat steel and you'll put a bevel, a 75 millimeter long bevel on your traction loss wheel plate on both sides. Then you'll tack, a nice tack on that end, a nice tack on this end, then carefully turn the base plate over, okay? Then tack, and when it's turned over, same. Nice tack on that end, nice tack on that end, and then run a bead. Along that side, which is now your underside, okay? Flip it back over, okay? And then you'll run a bead of weld in the other bevel. Done, that's it, it's joined. It's now on, and uh, we're ready to um, cut measure up and drill our Merbel that's going to attach to the bracket now so then we've got our motor isolated from the rest of the frame. Okay guys so um, look I can't remember off the top of my head how much Merbel decking timber I recommended you buy uh, back in video 1A okay of our materials list. I can't remember if it was four meters or five meters doesn't matter whichever it was that I told you to buy I'm assuming you have bought that okay and you are going to need to cut amongst other pieces that you're going to use. This is uh, our little bracket that we're going to use to connect our traction loss motor connecting rod to so that it's isolated from all the other motors and from everything else on the frame. So you need to cut a piece. Now it's 140 wide already when you get it and I'm assuming you're going to get it in one meter lengths, either four one meter lengths or five one meter lengths if I said to get five meters. If you get them all in one meter lengths they will serve you well. So off one of your one metre lengths, you're going to measure 115 millimetres. You're going to make a mark. Again, like with your metal, you're going to get a nice square. You're going to square on that 115 millimetre mark. You're going to draw a line so it's nice and straight. And then you will either with a hand saw, because we're talking about timber here now, you'll either use a hand saw or if you're fortunate enough to have a circular saw. Um, I don't think I included that in the uh, tools list, but hey, uh, if you're going to go on in the future and keep doing uh, projects using timber, using metal, it would be really handy to have a circular saw. Now, here's a little Azito uh, uh, circular saw. It's 135 millimetre. This one. Okay, it's just a little circular saw that takes a battery. Now, you're buying, if you end up buying the Azito impact drive, the, uh, X, the X series battery that you're going to need for your impact drive, it will work in the Zito X series circular saw. So maybe buy one of these. Again, I think the skin for this was $49. Okay, cheap as chips, and that's with the blade. I mean, we're not talking about earth shattering quality here, but it'll do for the odd job. And so you'll have a little circular saw you can use for all your timber projects. Pretty handy to have, and it saves a lot of time. Uh, using a hand saw. So whether it be hand saw or a circular saw like that, battery operated circular saw, where you make your mark, where you measure along your meter at 115 millimeters, make your mark, use a square to get a straight line, and then get your circular saw on that line and cut along that mark. So you've got a 115 millimeter wide piece of Merbau timber now. All right, now these holes where our bolts go through, um, I'll show you how you mark them. You mark them off the frame because you've now already built your bracket with the holes in it. You, you'll just sit this on and put a pen through the um, bracket holes and mark on that. But to get our hole here, which is going to take our connecting rod, that's gonna connect our motor to our frame, you will need to find the center of this point here. So you're gonna measure 30 millimeters from the edge where you've cut in and make a mark. And then down the bottom, just do the same again. Or if you've got a square, use one of your long squares and you could put a square on that mark going down this way and you could mark it. If you don't have your square long enough, just measure in 30 millimeters, mark it. Down here, measure in 30 millimeters, mark it, and then get a ruler and draw between those two marks. So you've got a straight line there. And then the same from the top. Measure down 30 millimeters, measure down 30 millimeters, mark it, and then where those two lines intersect, that is where you're gonna drill a hole. 
a 13 millimeter hole because your little connection here that your connecting rod's gonna go onto is a M12 size thread. And so you need a 13 millimeter hole for that to fit through. 13 millimeter hole, drilled nice and straight through this piece of timber. You'll have to clean it up a little bit. It'll be a bit chippy and shardy. Afterwards, you'll clean that up. That's done, you're ready to go. So what you'll do then, and this is why we've offset these holes, okay? Because although our, our hardwood timber is, is, is quite strong, we wanna keep pressure points on our timber away from the edges, okay? We don't wanna be putting uh, holes and stuff like that close to edges where they're gonna be under pressure because it'll split. The timber will end up splitting as, as good as hardwood is. It still has its limitations compared to metal. So we have to be a little bit careful in the way that we use it. These are our holes that ultimately we'll be drilling to take our bolts through into our bracket. And this is why these were not centered because I wanted these holes in our nerve, our bracket to be inboard, to be in from the edge as much as I could. I didn't want them too close to the edge because I don't want it to easily split when it's under pressure. So now what you can do, you can use one of your clamps if it's easier, okay? You will, you won't have the holes in your Merbau, but you will have your holes that you've already drilled in your bracket. You'll place your Merbau right at the top of uh, your bracket, like that flush and flush on the edge, right? Flush to the top, flush on the edge, square, hold it in place, right? Get a pen, get it all lined up and square on the bracket, clamp it. Then you can come around with your pen, poke your pen through the holes onto the Merbau, right? Then you can unclamp it, you'll turn it over and you'll have the marks exactly where um, they need to be on your bracket. Then you will take, then you will take an eight millimeter drill bit, same as what you drilled these holes with to take your M9 bolt, that same eight millimeter drill bit, which will drill metal or timber and you will drill through where you've marked these with your pen, with your Sharpie, right? Then you'll place it on and you'll use your M9 bolts to fasten this to the bracket. And once you've run your M9 bolts through your bracket, this is how it's gonna sit on your metal bracket. Important to use washers both sides of this one because you want a washer so then yet the head of your bolt doesn't start digging and biting in and eating into your timber, which it will do over time when the forces are on this piece of timber. You'll be forever having to do this up and it'll just keep eating into your timber and eventually you'll split this. Okay, so please use a washer on the bolt head side of both bolts and then use a washer, just a flat washer, or you can use a spring washer if you have them. Either will be fine just to stop these from... Um, uh, loosening off, or we talked about our Loctite, certainly would be a good application for your medium strength Loctite, to just put a little bit of Loctite on the thread, don't overdo it, just a little bit of Loctite on the thread, do them up and then they will not loosen off with vibration, because over time, you know, this is going through a fair bit of vibration, so you need washers, spring washers, or Loctite, or, or, or D, all of the above, will not hurt to keep this in place, okay?